So thank you very much. Um, it is not often that I get gold medals, and I've never got a gold medal from an undergraduate society, so I'm very honoured. Um, so today's talk is an experiment. I'm talking about something that I've never talked about before, so you're an audience of guinea pigs, and I hope that we will get lots of comments. If you are not chemists, do not be frightened. There's going to be no detailed chemistry whatsoever. And my point of my talk is to introduce what we believe is a new idea that has been thought up by my colleagues Mike George, Peter License, and me. And the idea is called a Moore's Law for Chemistry. And I will explain what that is in a little while. And I want your views on what you think of the Moore's Law of Chemistry. But let's begin with a few quite worrying facts. That during my lifetime, the population of the planet has increased by a factor of three. So there are now three times as many people living on Earth as they were when I was born in 1947. And this year alone, the population of the planet has increased already in 2018, increased by 65 million people. That is essentially the total population of the United Kingdom, probably including the population of Ireland as well. And there's a website, if you want to look at, which can actually show the births clocking up as literally as we speak. And the problem is that all of us are consume, or most of us, are consuming more and more material. And out of the 7.6 million people on the planet, and 7.6 billion, there are 1.5 billion who are profoundly poor and deserve to consume more. And just by profoundly poor, I'm sure there is some technical definition, but my working definition of profoundly poor is somebody who, if you ask them, can list everything that they own. I think with most of you, if I ask you how many socks you own, you probably don't know or can't remember without counting them. Certainly you won't know how many teaspoons your parents own. So these people are very poor. And just to give you quite an interesting statistic, there are now more people in the world who use mobile phones than use toothbrushes. Um, this says quite a lot about global oral hygiene, but the reason why this is particularly worrying is because a mobile, modern mobile phone, a smartphone, is there anybody here who doesn't own a smartphone? Each smartphone has somewhere between 40 and 50 of the 90 stable chemical elements in the periodic table. And the supplies of many of these elements are getting quite short. Um, elements are not like oil. They can't run out because you cannot destroy an element unless you have a nuclear reactor. But you can dig up the elements from somewhere where they're quite concentrated, platinum mine or whatever, and you can then dilute them and distribute them over the planet so that you cannot easily get them back. Now, much, many people are frightened of chemicals, but we cannot survive as a human race without use of chemicals. And <clears throat> everything that um, you use, I mean, if all the synthetic fibers disappeared from this room like that, we would all be sitting there naked, except perhaps my belt buckle would be there, and some of our shoes, which are leather, though of course they would not be tanned, because you need chemicals to tan the leather. And 
we need, everybody needs to use chemicals. And the problem is that um, when we make chemicals, we generate quite a lot of waste. And the way you can imagine this is that if you go into a restaurant and you have a nice duck dish or whatever, what you don't see is all the bones, the feathers, the beaks and the feet and so on, which at least most people don't eat, which are thrown away in the kitchen. And similarly, when we use chemicals, the final product that we use may have generated a lot of waste, which essentially is and that the resource thrown away. But the problem is that, um, as I say, we have a large number of people on our planet who deserve to consume more, but we have the problem that the <coughs> resources of the planet are finite, and therefore we don't have just an ever larger resource that we can bring in to satisfy the needs of these poor people. And at the same time, people who are consuming chemicals, like you getting your new shoes, new socks, you won't, you might, but most people won't want to give up these things. So, because I come from Nottingham, I've encapsulated the problem in what I call the Robin Hood question. And the Robin Hood question is how can we provide for the poor without robbing the rich? And in the case of chemistry, the obvious answer is that we have to try and make more chemicals from the same amount of starting material. That is, trying to reduce the waste, so if we begin with a kilo of starting material, we'll get as much as possible of that will end up in the um, products that people can use. And my area of research and the main area of research or major area of research at Nottingham is so-called green and sustainable chemistry, which is trying to devise cleaner ways of making chemicals and avoiding um, or <coughs> minimizing the amount of waste. Now quite a good example is the painkiller ibuprofen which incidentally was invented at Nottingham, not by the university, but by the Boots um, drug company. And the manufacture of ibuprofen over the last 20 years or so has been reduced from seven chemical steps to three chemical steps, and since each step produces waste, if you reduce the number of steps, you can reduce the uh, amount of waste. And as the treasurer said in his introduction, my, one of the particular areas I have been um, working on is reducing the volume of solvents that are used in chemical reactions. And a very striking example, again from the pharmaceutical industry, which is not my area, not my own work, but a very good example of what people are trying to achieve is the drug Viagra, which I think most of you have heard of. And when Viagra was first made, um, it required 1,300 litres, that's more than a tonne weight of solvent, to make a kilo of product. But by applying the principles of green chemistry and using solvents more efficiently, that 1,300 litres was changed to six and a half litres, so a very dramatic um, change. And that's the current process that's been used by Pfizer to make the um, Viagra. So, chemists are improving ways of making chemicals to try and um, reduce the waste and so on. However, this is what brings us into the idea of the Moore's Law from, for chemicals or for chemistry because just making the processes cleaner, I and my colleagues feel 
will not be enough in the long term. So, let me just remind you what Moore's Law um, stated. And there, there, there are different versions of Moore's Law, <coughs> but the gist of it is that for integrated circuits such as you find in computers, <coughs> the density of transistors per unit area doubles every 18 months. And the cost of producing the new chip is about half that that it was in the previous 18 months. And just to give you an example, this is my first um, flash drive that I ever bought. And it costs 64 pounds and has 128 megabytes, which is about <coughs> two megabytes per, um, per pound, which for the purpose today is the same as for a euro. Um, and this is my latest one, you can see it's much smaller. This one is 16 gigabytes, and this one has um, cost eight pounds, so it has 1,280 times more memory storage than this one, and it cost an eighth of the price. And they're about 10 years apart. So this is the real Morsley. Now, the thinking between, behind uh, Moore's law from chemistry is a bit different. And the starting point is the idea that although we all use chemicals, we don't actually consciously buy chemicals. If somebody wants to buy a nice perfume, they don't buy a bottle because it contains 50 milligrams or oh, 500 milligrams of rose oxide. They buy the perfume because they want to get a nice smell on their body for an evening. And it doesn't really matter to them how much chemical is in the perfume, provided that one bottle will give them six months worth of evenings out. Similarly, if you have a headache, you take a pill, and you take the pill because you want to get rid of the headache, not because you're desperate to eat 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. And uh, perhaps the, the, the um, crudest example is that if you buy um, a bottle of water, you don't buy the bottle of water because you want to buy a certain weight of polyethylene terephthalate, but you want it because you want to drink. So our starting point is that really people are buying services, they're not buying chemicals, and the chemicals just happen to be the method that provides that service. So this is where our idea of Moore's Law for chemistry comes in which is that we should, over a period, and we suggested five years, but the precise period doesn't matter, try and halve the amount of chemicals that we use to produce a particular effect. So, just to give you a concrete example, this is a water bottle from Hong Kong, um, it's called Watson's Water, and this is a bottle from um, <coughs> bottle from America, crystal water, and you can see, for example, the size of the cap on these two is very different, and the amount of plastic here is very much smaller than the amount of plastic here, and the whole bottle here, even without the cap, weighs more than the American bottle. And both of these I got because I wanted to drink of water, and so this one, though it's a bit floppy, would be fine. And because the manufacturers pressurise it with nitrogen gas, which is free from the air, when I bought it, it felt just as rigid as this one. So I could get my drink for just half as much plastic as from the other one. So the idea of Moore's Law of Chemistry is that every five years, we should halve the amount of um, chemicals that we're using 
And if you think about it, if we do that for a number of cycles, say um, six cycles, five or six cycles, we will go to using a tiny fraction of the chemicals that we're using now, but everybody will sound the same effect. After four cycles, we will have six, one sixteenth of the amount of chemicals. If we go on to um, six cycles, we will have um, <coughs> 32 times, or I'm sorry, 64 times, and so on. And so the idea is that our idea is that by getting this philosophical concept of Moore's law of chemistry, we can have an idea that everybody can share from the people who make the chemicals to those who buy them. And just to give you an example, coming back to the uh, perfumes, there are now compounds that have been developed for perfumes that smell 10,000 times stronger than rose oxide. So you need very, very much less in the perfume for it to smell the same. And actually, if you ask the customer, the customer will probably be really happy if their perfume contains less chemicals. Now, in order to do this, I think there will be no problem in people buying less chemicals provided that their bottle of water or whatever provides the service that they want. On the other hand, it does require a change in the way that businesses operate. Because at the moment, businesses, and Niall the economist may um, correct me, but businesses usually have their business model, they want to sell as much product as they can. So for a chemical company, it's tons of polyethylene terephthalate or whatever. And so the chemical companies will need to change their business model where they see that they are selling a service. They're selling a drink of water rather than selling a plastic bottle. But this idea of changing the business model <coughs> is already in the air. The United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, has a scheme which they call chemical leasing, which is moving very much towards the idea that companies should be producing chemicals for a service rather than producing chemicals just because they're chemicals. So, Mike and I and Pete believe that our idea of Moore's Law of Chemistry gives an idea that everybody from Greenpeace to the Chemistry Industries Association can buy into as a way of trying to get the same benefits for society but with less chemicals. Now of course there's going to be a huge amount of research that will need to be done. You won't be able to reduce all the chemicals as dramatically as others but as you can see from the example of Viagra, making Viagra, the example of, um, make, of making better perfumes, these are realistic goals. This is not science fiction. We ought to be able to do it if everybody um, gets, um, buys into the idea. So, just to summarise, if we are to satisfy the needs of the human population in the future, when it will be bigger than it is now, if we can give everybody on the planet the same benefit from chemicals that we in the developed West or North, depending how you describe it, um, are enjoying, then we need to make our chemicals more cleanly with green chemistry, sustainable chemistry, but we also need to use our chemicals much more effectively. And I hope that Moore's Law for Chemistry can become a shared vision that everybody can buy into <coughs> and <coughs> work towards so that we will have your children, your grandchildren, great-grandchildren have a sustainable future. So, now, I want to hear what you think. And I would also 
at the end, or by the end, please fill in the questionnaire on the back because we're really interested to see whether what I've said has made you change your views. And I brought some copies of the article, it's only two pages, that we wrote about Moore's Law for Chemistry, and it will be on the desk as you go out. If you want a copy, it's although it's from a chemical journal, it's not technical, it was the editorial, not a main page. And again, if you afterwards get any ideas or interesting questions, you can always email me or my colleagues to say what you think. So, let me know what you think now. Thank you. With a question of my own, I was very curious when you were talking about, I would say, the, the, in light of the recent UN report and the UN panels, um, on this site, there was a lot of chemistry and increasing the efficiency. Um, but has there been much, I suppose, buy-in from non-NGO organisations? Have businesses taken well to this kind of proposed idea? Oh, well, the, uh, the idea is very new, and so we have published it, um, we published it, so <clears throat> I can't remember, but um, in the spring. The one effect which is quite exciting is that um, UNIDO, the organisation that has proposed the um, <coughs> chemical leasing, has shortlisted our work for the 2019 um, Chemical Leasing Research Award and my colleague Mike George is going to Vienna to the award ceremony. It's one of these ceremonies like the Oscars where you go to the dinner and then the, the prize winner is announced. So we don't know whether he's going to win or not, but, um, or we're going to win, but he's quite excited and so are we. I'm just wondering in terms of the uh, comparison with Moore's Law, you, in your way, they say that a point will come when we can't actually have any more transistors on a chip. Yeah. Well, do you think a similar point would come in chemistry where we can't get, have the process get any more efficient? And then if population growth just continues to grow, like we're going to be left at the same point that we just can't streamline the process and we're left. Yes, but, but, but you see, um, I don't think there's any danger of that happening because Moore's law has gone on for um, I can't remember, since the 1960s. So your bank card has considerably more computing power than took the Apollo astronauts to the moon. And with chemicals, if we reduce our usage of chemicals by a factor of 30, we could keep going for not the totally foreseeable future, but for a very long time. So we don't need quite such a dramatic the um, reduction has been for computers, but on the other hand, technologically, it's a much bigger challenge because there are more chemicals and getting better effects is going to be hard. But I don't think we will run into, um, run into technical problems of uh, well, the, the obvious limit is homeopathic medicine, which has nothing in it. And, um, <coughs> but which still some people swear has some effect, which good luck to them. But, and I think the, um, but I, I'm not suggesting we go to that level. Uh, if you want to just make, I'm just saying my question slightly. Um, it's on the question of whether if it's more expensive for businesses to be environmentally efficient, what incentives do people have, do businesses have to do so? Um, well, I think the answer is that, um, first of all, I, it is not necessarily more expensive for people to be environmentally efficient. For example, in the UK, and I suspect it's the same here in Ireland, the cost of disposing waste has rocketed. So if you produce less waste, you um, in itself will um, save money. If that waste is not toxic, then you save even more money because you don't take, have to take all sorts of precautions in getting rid of it. The other thing is that if the public 
starts buying into the idea of Moore's laws of chemicals for chemistry, people will be able to advertise the shampoo now with half the chemicals. The problem at the moment is if you tell somebody that there are chemicals in their shampoo, they will look in horror and say, I'll buy another brand that doesn't have chemicals in them. And so I think it does have to have a change for the public, but I don't think that I think that it could really become quite a strong marketing drive. After all, people pay a lot more money for eggs from chickens that are happy at the moment. And um, even though the eggs may not taste much different. So I think there could really, um, it could become the market driver. I was wondering about when you uh, mentioned that um, you know, people tend to be foil and hard when you mentioned the word chemical. Um, how do you think that we should try and kind of change like, the public perception on the idea of chemicals? Um, like, do you think that this could be something that we tackle in like, early education? or um, Because to buy into the idea of more law chemistry, you kind of have to um, understand that chemicals are not inherently dangerous, of course. Well, I think, I think the answer is well, that it works on several levels. Interestingly, chemists, I don't, how many people here are chemists? Quite a few. Chemists, until recently, thought that we were misunderstood and the public did not realise what good we were doing and so on. And the Royal Society of Chemistry um, did a survey, I think now it must be two years ago, what the public thought of chemists. And once that got over the problem that they explained to the public they weren't talking about pharmacy shops. It turned out that the image of chemists, people doing chemistry, was really pretty good. We're not as misunderstood as we thought. And the problem at the moment with the word chemical is that it's often associated with the adjectives toxic or nasty. But if you have a few NGOs starting to promote Moore's Law of chemis for Chemistry as something positive, I think it will be quite easy to change people's attitudes. You've just got to look at the um, David Attenborough program, um, Blue Planet 2, which has completely changed people's attitudes to plastic with a series of half a dozen television programs. When I was at Birmingham Airport yesterday, there were water taps for refilling water bottles, which a year ago there wouldn't have been, they would have tried to sell me another water bottle. Incidentally, I should say that this bottle has already been refilled several times, so it's applying, um, acting as good service. Um, so I think changing people's attitudes is hard, but it's not impossible. I mean, when I was your age, the idea that you could stop people smoking in pubs would be totally unimaginable. And now, everybody takes it, or most people take it as normal. And so changing people's behaviour, if it's done in the right way and with a general spirit, is possible. Do you think the moral responsibility for being more green kind of lies with us as individuals or for companies to kind of sell us greener products? Um, I, think, I think it is um, it is a combination. I mean, everybody should, um, should act in an ethical way, but companies cannot sell people greener products unless they want them. And I think that it is really important that people like you, collectively, who are well educated, who understand the problems, set an example so that other people, so you can explain to other people and start setting the trends. And it doesn't necessarily take much more effort to live in a greener way. And it doesn't mean that we all have to live in houses 
with no central heating where you fix sweaters. But on the other hand, it does mean, for example, that you should wear a thick sweater when you're outside the pub, rather than using a patio heater to heat the air just so you can wear a skimpy top, and so on. And so there are all sorts of things which we can do, which most people don't do now. And they don't do it because they don't think about it. But, I mean, after all, um, if you consider um, what Dublin was probably like when the hist was started. The um, streets were um, awash with horse excrement. There were probably no, very little sanitation in Dublin. People were probably um, relieving themselves, defecating in the streets and things like that, which now would be totally unacceptable. So one can change. And you, as the young people, are those who have to drive the change. So, I was told you were really good at asking difficult questions. Keep going. Now, you just said some of the pharmacies there. Do you disagree with pharmacies personally? Is that... No. No. You... No, 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 of course I don't. I get headaches just the same as everybody else yes. and so on. Of course you need pharmacies. Yes. No, I, was just, I wasn't saying anything against pharmacies. I was just saying that um, if you ask the public what they think of chemists, their first idea is what do you think of a chemist shop rather than what they, do you think of a chemical scientist. They, they do try to um, sell natural products. Nowadays, more more chemists do. More in Dublin, in Dublin they do. They have they have tried in selling natural products at a reasonable price of late You know, I think the LIT improved myself. You know. Yeah, I I think very much so. And some of the that was the basis of the question. I wasn't trying to suggest to you that you have a. I am now the difference myself. We have a time for speakers. If anybody has any questions, the gentleman in the yellow top over there is. In terms of the way you were talking about um, Moore's Law of Chemistry, is there yep. a way that that could be applied to um, fuels? To fuels? Yeah. Um, I think the uh, fuels. There, is, there are improvements you can make on um, the fuel consumption. The car that drove me to Birmingham Airport, the driver was saying, it's a big car, said that he managed to get um, 79 miles per gallon for the car. But there will be a thermodynamic limit. You can work out that with the efficiency of the engine and the speed of the car, eventually, there won't be enough energy stored in the fuel, but you can make things more fuel efficient. The question about fuels is very much linked to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, where we want to limit CO2 emissions. And you can fuel cars in different ways, with electricity, with hydrogen, but with chemicals, you cannot get away with the need that if you want to treat somebody's ailment, you need to have some sort of chemical entity that you put into the person. So you can change the chemical entity, but you won't be able to just treat them with electricity. Well, so they used to, you know, put big voltages in people's heads when they were, thought they were mad, but that was shown to be not very effective. So I think the question of fuels and transport is also very much one of behavioural change. And your colleague over there was asking about behavioural change. I, for my first 36 years in Nottingham, I drove to work every day. Then a new tram system started in the city and I started going on the tram because I could do email on the tram and it was 
I didn't have to rush in to get a parking space. I now feel positively irritated on the few occasions I have to drive in. So it is possible to um, change behaviour even of old dinosaurs like me. So for young people it's much easier to change their behaviour. Well, I think there's several things you can say about the fashion industry. The first thing is they produce clothes like this student that has to be dry cleaned and uses lots of organic solvent, much of which is lost. In principle, you could make clothes that were largely self-cleaning or could just be rinsed in water. And then the fashion industry could um, if they wanted, it would require some PR, um, actually um, make it a source of pride that people were wearing a suit that was 15 years old. You know, just people say, my God, yours is newer than mine, mine's better, you see. So there are, th you can change things. There is also the um, idea that um, you could use um, things like the effect of sun to make clothes much more exciting. There was a paper published in 1912 that suggested you should put photochromic dyes. These are dyes that change colour with light. So that when you went out into the sunlight, your blue jumper, I mean, yellow jumper would suddenly turn bright purple or whatever, and then when you went indoors again, it would turn yellow. And so, if you like, you get two, two pieces of clothing for the price of one. So I think the answer is, of course, the fashion industry would have to change. But it would be quite easy to change, because if you look at the group here, nobody except me is wearing a tie. And when I was a student, quite a lot of people wore ties. And in my father's generation, all men wore hats. And apart from cyclists and a few eccentrics, I don't know if you can remember when you last saw somebody wearing a hat. And so fashion, if you get the right leaders to do it, is probably one of the easier things to change. Um, I just have a question about uh, different um, potential for yeah, improving the, uh, or applying Moore's law to chemistry. You take uh, molecules that are involved in the plastic of uh, your water bottle, it seems like there's less room for improvement of efficiency in the arrangement of those molecules than there would be, for instance, for a, a, chem for a compound that's involved in a perfume. Whereas, um, so I'm wondering if you, if you take into account that there might be different um, rates of efficiency depending on which use of the chemical uh, you're thinking of. No, you probably, you may not be able to change the plastic at all, but you may be able to change the design of bottle so that you could get the same effect of the bottle as uh, <coughs> with less plastic. Um, not my part of Nottingham is quite unusual that you can still get milkmen to deliver bottles of milk. It's not every day now, it's every other day. And I've never seen the person, but I think it's a milkman rather than a milkwoman. And, but the, plastic, the glass bottle it comes in now weighs a small fraction of the milk bottles that were around when I was your age. Because people have discovered, learnt how to strengthen the glass through processing. Chemically it's the same formula, but by the heat treatment, it is more, it's tougher, so you can get away with lighter weight. And so, I think in the short term, you can do quite a lot. And as I mentioned with the 
crystal part water there, if you pressurise the bottles with nitrogen, then <coughs> the pressure of, CO, of, of nitrogen makes the bottle rigid, and so you can get away with much thinner plastic. Um, you can hear that it, it, it's very thin and can crunch it. The problem is that you can't really reuse this bottle because um, it's not as tough as this one. The, the difficulty is that here in Dublin, you can go on refilling this from the tap. If you are in China, where this bottle came from, most of the tap water is undrinkable, or not safe to drink, and therefore you can't fill it from the tap, and so a lighter one might be more sensible. We have time for one more question. Um, just with regards to the, the plastic bottles and how um, you often hear about how um, plastic takes so many odd thousand years to, to degrade and um, balance the environment, are there any potential um, uh, chemical solutions to the problem of like maybe a way that we could find a way to degrade it easier? Or um. Well, I don't, you may not have read that there was a, a group of researchers, I think in Japan, who've discovered, I think it may be a fungus or bacteria that can digest plastic. They found it on some rubbish dump, but there was a lot of plastic. But the other thing is, perhaps we're looking at the plastic bottle in the wrong way. That is, we should be looking at the plastic bottle not as an end product, but something that we're just borrowing and that we should then return, which either for recycling, the problem with the recycling at the moment is the top is made from a different plastic to the body and it has a label which has to be removed and that's quite expensive. Or we may decide that we should regard the bottle as heating fuel that is, we're just borrowing before it's burnt, and then just burn it and recover the energy from the bottle. That of course leads to questions about CO2 release into the atmosphere and so on, but again, there is a whole series of questions, not only the effect we get from the chemicals, but how we use the chemicals in their whole life cycle, that is from when they manufactured from when they're disposed of. It's quite frightening that when you take medicines, most of the medicines end up in the sewage system. They just pass straight through you. And for some things it doesn't matter, but on the other hand, if you have taking um, contraceptive pills, you don't want those to start affecting the fish in rivers and so on. So it is really um, we have to look at the whole life cycle, but I think Moore's law, well, I believe that Moore's law for chemistry would be a good starting place and something that is a very simple idea to explain to people. Thank you very much.